three visitors. Three visitors are here. A woman, a boy, a girl. I strut across my domain for them. I dangle from my tire swing. I eat three banana peels in a row. The boy spits at my window. The girl throws a handful of pebbles. Sometimes I'm glad the glass is there. My visitors return. After the show, the spit pebble children come back. I display my impressive teeth. I splash in my filthy pool. I grunt and hoot. I eat and eat and eat some more. The children pound their pathetic chests. They toss more pebbles. Slimy chimps, I mutter. I throw a me ball at them. Sometimes I wish the glass were not there. Sorry. I'm sorry I called those children slimy chimps. My mother would be ashamed of me. Julia. Like the spit pebble children, Julia is a child, but that, after all, is not her fault. While her father, George, cleans them all each night, Julia sits by my domain. She could sit anywhere she wants, by the carousel, in the empty food court, on the bleachers coated in sawdust. But I am not bragging when I say she always chooses to sit with me. I think it's because we both love to draw. Sarah, Julia's mother, used to help clean them all. But when she got sick and grew pale and stopped, Sarah stopped coming. Every night, Julia offers to help George. And every night, he says firmly, Homework, Julia. The floors will just get dirty again. Homework, I have discovered, involves a sharp pencil and thick boots and long sighs. I enjoy chewing pencils. I'm sure I would excel at homework. Sometimes, Julia dozes off. And sometimes, she reads her books. But mostly... She draws pictures and talks about her day. I don't understand why people talk to me, but they often do. Perhaps it's because they think I can't understand them. Or perhaps it's because I can't talk back. Julia likes science and art. She doesn't like Lila Burpee, who teases her because her clothes are old, and she does like Deshaun Williams, who teases her too, but in a nice way. And she would like to be a famous artist when she grows up. Sometimes Julia draws me. I'm an elegant fellow in her pictures with my silver back gleaming like moon on moss. I never look angry the way I do on the fading billboard by the highway. I always look a bit sad though. Drawing Bob. I love Julia's pictures of Bob. She draws him flying across the page, a blur of feet and fur. She draws him motionless, peeking out from behind a trash can or the soft hill of my belly. Sometimes in her drawings, Julia gives Bob's wings or a lion's mane. Once, she gave him a tortoise shell. But the best thing she ever gave him wasn't a drawing. Julia gave Bob his name. For a long time, no one knew what to call Bob. Now and then, a mall worker would try to approach him with a tidbit. Here, doggy, they'd call, holding out a french fry. Come on, pooch, they'd say. How about a little piece of sandwich? But he would always vanish into the shadows before anyone could get too close. One afternoon, Julia decided to draw the little dog curled up in the corner of my domain. First, she watched him for a long time, chewing on her thumbnail. I could tell she was looking at him the way an artist looks at the world when she's trying to understand it. Finally, she grabbed her pencil and set to work. When she was finished, she held up the page. There he was, the tiny big-eared dog. He was smart and cunning, but his gaze was wistful. Under the picture were three bold, confident marks, circled in black. I was pretty certain it was a word, even though I couldn't read it. Julia's father peered over her shoulder. That's him exactly, he said, nodding. He pointed at the circle marks. I didn't realize his name was Bob, he said. Me either, said Julia. She smiled. I had to draw him first. Bob and Julia. Bob will not let humans touch him. He says their scent upsets his digestion. But every now and then I see him sitting at Julia's feet, her fingers gently moving just behind his right ear. Mac. Usually, Mac leaves after the last show. But tonight, he's in his office working late. When he's done, he stops by my domain and stares at me for a long time while he drinks from a brown bottle. 
George joins him, broom in hand, and Max says the things he always says. How about that game last night? And business has been slow, but it'll get better. You'll see. And don't forget to empty the trash. Mac glances over at the picture Julia is drawing. What are you making? He asks. It's for my mom, Julia said. It's a flying dog. She holds up her drawing, eyeing it critically. She likes airplanes and dogs. Hmm, Mac murmurs, sounding unconvinced. He looks at George. How's the wife doing anyway? About the same, George says. She has good days and bad days. Yeah, don't we all, Mac says. Mac starts to leave, then pauses. He reaches into his pocket, pulls out a crumpled green bill, and presses it into George's hand. Here, Mac says with a shrug, buy the kids some more crayons. Mac is already out the door before George can yell, thanks! Not sleepy. Stella, I say after Julia and her father go home, I can't sleep. Of course you can, she says. You are the king of sleepers. Shh, Bob says from his perch on my belly. I'm dreaming about chili fries. I'm tired, I say, but I'm not sleepy. What are you tired of? Stella asks. I think for a while. It's hard to put into words. Gorillas are not complainers. We're dreamers, poets, philosophers, nap takers. I don't know exactly. I kick at my tire swing. I think I may be a little tired of my domain. That's because it's a cage, Bob tells me. Bob is not always tactful. I know, Stella says, it's a very small domain. You're a very big gorilla, Bob adds. Stella, I ask. Yes? I noticed you were limping more than usual today. Is your leg bothering you? Just a little, Stella answers. I sigh. Bob resettles. His ears flick. He drools a bit, but I don't mind. I'm used to it. Try eating something, Stella says. That always makes you happy. I eat an old brown carrot. It doesn't help but I don't tell Stella. She needs to sleep. You could try remembering a good day, Stella suggests. That's what I do when I can't sleep. Stella remembers every moment since she was born, every scent, every sunset, every slight, every victory. You know, I can't remember much, I say. There's a difference, Stella says gently, between can't remember and won't remember. That's true, I admit. Not remembering can be difficult. I've had a lot of time to work on it. Memories are precious, Stella adds. They help tell us who we are. Try remembering all your keepers. You always liked Carl, the one with the harmonica. Carl, yes, I remember how he gave me a coconut when I was still a juvenile. It took me all day to open it. I try to recall other keepers I've known. The humans who cleaned my domain and prepared my food and sometimes kept me company. There was Juan who poured Pepsis into my waiting mouth, and Katrina, who used to poke me with a broom when I was sleeping, and Alan, who sang, How much is that monkey in the window? with a sad smile while she scrubbed my water bowl. And there was Gerald, who once brought me a box of fat, sweet strawberries. Gerald was my favorite keeper. I haven't had a real keeper in a long time. Max says he doesn't have the money to pay for an ape babysitter. These days, George cleans my cage, and Mac is the one who feeds me. When I think about all the people who have taken care of me, mostly it's Mac, I recall, day in and day out, year after year. Mac, who bought and raised me, and says I'm no longer cute. As if a silverback could ever be cute. Moonlight falls on the frozen carousel, on the silent popcorn stand, on the stall of leather belts that smell like long-gone cows. The heavy work of Stella's breathing sounds like the wind in the trees, and I wait for sleep to find me.